Amen. Good evening. How's everybody doing tonight? Well, it's incredible to be with the family on Wednesday. Wow. There's a lot happening, huh? Amen. Who needs midweek tonight? Raise your hand. Amen. Amen. I need midweek. You know, tonight uh, I want to talk about a topic uh, that eludes most people on this planet. Yeah, we're all in the same boat in that what I'm going to talk about tonight is something that we all actually take for granted. The people who focus on this topic most typically understand it least. And so it's going to be an incredible topic tonight. But you got to want it, you know what I'm saying? You got to want to need that. You have to want the truth tonight. Who wants it tonight? Yeah, let me hear it. You want, you want the truth of the Bible here tonight? I get, that doesn't sound like you really want truth. Sound like you had a long week, you know? Uh, to start us off, I'm going to show a powerful video, very brief, that my son Dylan shot this last Saturday morning on our way to the basketball league. Yeah, from the beginning. Just hit the stop button and then play. Yeah, stop. Play again. There you go. Play again, right in the middle of the screen. This was on the corner right by our house. So there was an eight-car pileup on the corner of Aviation and Artesia. That white car went through the, right, right next to the sign there. And you can see it right there. The front tire came off. He went right through all, the, all the, the brush and everything, and you can see the guys doing CPR right in the middle of the parking lot there. Go ahead and play it all the way through. And uh, sadly, that guy did not make it. And uh, that's, uh, whew. You can switch it back now. Go ahead and bring the lights up. That's sobering. That's sobering. It makes us all really quiet. Tonight, we're going to talk about grace. See, that guy did not receive grace, but you have received grace tonight from God. And that's something that's got to really change us in a powerful way. I want to ask you, why do you do what you do, really? What motivates you? What drives you? What inspires you? Most importantly, what and who teaches you about righteousness? And about godliness. That's what we're going to talk about tonight. You know, Paul said, for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. He said, if I am to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. To set the tone for today's lesson, I want to start in Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. The title of tonight's lesson is The Effect of Grace. The Effect of Grace. Titus 2 verse 1. The shock of death is of God. But you can't stay down because you're not dead. And there's a reason for that. Titus 2 verse 1. Paul says, you must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Jump over to verse 7. In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness. And soundness of speech that cannot be condemned. So that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Now jump on over to verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. You know, everybody does know about Jesus here in the United States. We've all heard of him. We all read about him. Everybody knows who he is, but very few know about his grace. Very few know what it's like to receive his grace. And yet he says, grace teaches us right here, verse, verse 12. I want you to really consider, who teaches you godliness and righteousness? Is it your discipler? Is it your church leader? Is it our movement leader? Or is it grace? 
See, grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness. You know, uh, if you are choosing to not sin of your own will, you're going to be a tired person. You tried to stop of your own will and your own accord before you were baptized. How'd that work for you? The moment there was a hard situation, sleep. Because we can't handle repenting of our own strength. We must do it because of what Jesus did for us. So it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions. You know, like that awesome car you want to buy? The big house that you want to have, the picket fence, the two and a half kids. Just say no to two and a half and have one or three or four. Don't do a half a kid. That don't work out well. But see, worldly passions pull us away from God. Oh, you can make all the money in the world you want, but you can't lean on it. You can't trust in it. Your trust must be in the Lord. Amen. See, and what grace teaches us is to say no to those things that pull us from God. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope. Oh, hope's a great thing. And hope's a terrible thing. Depending on what you put your hope in. What is your hope in tonight? Is, it, is, your, is your one and only true hope to make it to heaven? To not be that guy? It's going to come in a flash. You're not going to know when it comes, how it's going to come, what's going to happen. It could come tonight on your way home. It could come tomorrow, next week. But knowing that and knowing you have grace now, how are you going to choose to live because of that? How grateful are you going to be for what Jesus did for you because of that? We must put our hope in Jesus and his resurrection tonight. Amen? He says, the glorious appearing of the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, check this out, eager to do what is good. I hope you're getting a little more revved up to be eager to do what is good tonight. Because you know what God did for you. With all these principles in mind, let's talk about the effect of grace in your life for a moment. One Friday afternoon, God watched his son being falsely accused by all in Jerusalem. Beaten, kicked on, spit on, crucified. And he watched his son die. The most horrible death a man could die. Because we're not contrite. For every time we're not humble. For every time we're in peer or bitter. Or when we just look at God's word and don't tremble. You know, I've got some good news to share. It's going to get better, I promise you. Since the beginning of this year, 22 people have been added to this church in the first 14 weeks. Is that not an incredible thing? <laughs> Corey and G have laid a foundation building this group from nine people to over 150 people. Oh, approaching 160 people. Is that not incredible? 15 of those 22 people this year received God's grace for the very first time in their life in baptism. Is that not awesome? I mean, you just saw one right before this lesson. I mean, we've had these powerful baptisms, baptism after baptism after baptism after baptism since the beginning of the year. What's it done for you so far? What's it taught you? Each time, did you get more obedient because you saw God's grace in effect? Each time, did you start to say no to ungodliness more? Did you get more self-controlled? I know you like to hear that control word, right? I mean, who talks about control when they talk about grace? Grace is supposed to be you just didn't get what you deserve, right? 
And yet the Bible says it teaches you to be more self-controlled. Controlled by the word of God. Is that not an awesome thing? Can we, can we work at being more controlled by the word of God tonight? I mean, after God has worked so powerfully in our own individual lives, and after Corey and G have built us a congregation that allows us to see it happen almost every single week, how could we go back to our old sins? How could we give in to new, old attitudes and our old demeanor? How could we not be in a place where we don't just thrive simply because of grace? Our first point is not without effect. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Paul says, now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that was preached to you which you have received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. And the church said, Amen. I want to help you out with something, all right? I'm going to go to war with you a little bit here. Okay? Because we've got to have the right understanding here, right? Some of you know where I'm going with this. Have you ever been to a baseball game? How many of you love football? Yeah? Do you sit like that when there's a touchdown and you're watching the game? And yet I tell you you're saved and you don't act better than you do when you're watching a football game? We really need an understanding of grace in our life. You know what I'm saying? Because it is the motivator. In fact, it's the only motivator that's going to get you to heaven. We can put all the greatest preachers on the planet up here in front of you and they ain't going to get you to heaven. Unless they can get you to focus on grace. Unless they can be, get you to be motivated by grace. They can get you to be changed by grace, not just at your baptism, but every single day, man. He says, by this gospel, verse 2, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you believe in vain. See, it's not enough to just get baptized. It's not enough to just be fired up to, that we have a great church. You have to hold firmly to the end if you're going to make it. Are you going to make that choice tonight? I see some of your faces, you're not holding firm. I can see it. That's all right, because I've been there. We've all been there. But, you know, we got to really spend more time looking in each other's eyes. Some of us just blow right through the fellowship. Don't want to look at nobody because you don't want nobody to look at you. Because you know you're not holding firmly. And tonight is just a night of freedom. Tonight's a night to just let it all on out there. You know what I'm saying? Get it on out there. Get it out into the light. Repent of it and let the power of grace affect your life again. Right here in verse, uh, in verse 3, he says, For what I received I passed on to you as of, check this out, first importance. That's grace. There's nothing more important than that. Do you have anything right now that's more important than grace? You know, you ever seen the brother who really wants to date somebody? What's the, what's the first thing that comes out of his mouth? Something about the person he wants to date, right? <laughs> Every time you get in a conversation, you know it's coming up, right? Oh, boy, oh, yeah, this sister's so awesome. I just want to go on a date. You know, we just, we just had an awesome date. And, and yet, you know, what's important to you, you talk about. What's important to you, you focus on. It just flows out of you. Nobody has to tell you to talk about it. You know, you never seen the guy that just got married? You never have to get him to talk. You don't have to convince him to talk about his marriage. You know what I'm saying? Oh, my wife's so awesome. Did I tell you I was married? Yeah, you told me last time we talked. <laughs> and yet, you know, and yet, and yet in our entire 150 people with all the baptisms we've seen and all of that, there's like seven people studying the Bible right now. Why is that? Because... Grace is not the priority it should be in our lives right now. But, but, you know, we've all been in that place, haven't we not? And you know what does that a lot is change and transition. You know what I'm saying? And we just get off focus. We just forget about, you know, we start focusing on, oh, this and what we're losing and what we're gaining. And, you know, whether we like it or not and whether we agree. And, and all of a sudden, grace is just gone. And the power of our lives is gone when we get to that place. He goes on here and he says, uh, 
after he talks about grace being of first importance, of course, the gospel is all about grace. And when he talks about the gospel, of course, he's talking about grace here. But he says here, first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he's raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve, and after that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living. He says, then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, he appeared to me also as one abnormally born. Now check out Paul's view of himself. This is pretty cool. For I am the least of the apostles. Wait a minute. I thought he was like the greatest of all of them. I thought he had the most impact of any of the guys. And yet Paul's true view of himself, because we know the Bible doesn't lie, right? So we're not, we know we're not reading a lie right here when Paul says this. We know he's telling the truth about himself. Is that he was the least of the apostles and don't even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. He says, but. Now, usually buts are bad. Bro, you really need it. Well, you know, but. It's just, it's just bad. They just don't work. It's just an excuse you sell somebody and try and get them to buy it. And if they do, then they're off your back, you know. But, but, you know, buts are usually bad, but in this case, it's good. He says, but, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And check this out. And his grace was not without effect. There is no life worth living unless it's affected by the grace of God. There is no life on this earth worth living unless it comes from the effect of grace of God. He says, no, I worked harder than all of them. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. You know, in this church, we are all about the gospel, the good news, the grace of God, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's what the church is about. I know it's what the Blackwells are about. It's what Tracy and I are about. But tonight, is it what you're about? Is it really what you are about? Or are you about your job and getting married and who your interest is? At the end of the day, we've got to come back to the place we were at our baptism. Was that not an incredible baptism we just saw? See, God's grace was on me that he gave us a baptism right before I preached this lesson. That's pretty awesome. See, the grace of God cannot be without effect in your life. You know, you go a day, then you go two days, then three days, a week, then a month, and then you're still the same. And then your heart hardens. Just... And then all of a sudden, church isn't as fun anymore. You know what I'm saying? All of a sudden, oh, you know, I'm I just too busy for that D time. D time should be awesome. Because we learn about the grace of God that we received for the sin that we had in the last week. I mean, let me tell you what. If you end every communion every Sunday with grace, you should be fired up. I don't know. 